Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Tony T's Toon Talk, available at the Port Washington Public Library's YouTube channel. I'm your host, Tony Chiguardo, and I'm ready to talk tunes. The Beatles right here, they made some. Hey, the Monkees made some. Even Alice Cooper and Kiss made some. And most folks would say that the Knack made a lot of it. What am I talking about? I am talking about music that fits into a genre called power pop. And how is power pop defined? Well, trying to find an exact definition of power pop that all music scholars agree on is something akin to asking 10 of your friends what the best flavor of ice cream is. However, there are a few qualities that most hardcore musos will agree are present in all great power pop songs. And they are strong melodies, clear and emotive vocals, crisp vocal harmonies, economical arrangements. We're not talking about yes here. Songs usually go A, B, C, A, B, B, and out. We're not looking at 87 different sections. Then you've got prominent guitar riffs. You're going to have a cool lick that's going to repeat itself, a little bit of an edge, guitar-driven melody usually. And you're going to get a forceful, snappy drum sound. And also, of course, plenty of hooks, lots and lots of earworms, as we call them. Instrumental solos, kept to a minimum. You're not getting a lot of weedly, 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 wee in your power pop song. The blues elements, da na 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 downplayed usually, not too prevalent in your power pop tunes. Compressed, tight, sonic production. The songs sound great, the instruments sound sharp, you're not looking at anything big and bombastic. And with that in mind, the band lineup, usually two guitars, bass and drums, maybe some keyboards, maybe some strings, maybe a little synthesizer, but that's not where the emphasis is, not at all. Power pop also doesn't really fit into a specific time frame or a datable trend the way something like disco did. But some folks do consider the first true power pop song to hit the charts to be Bad Finger Single No Matter What from 1970. From that point on, power pop bands were popping up, see what I did there, everywhere. And on this week's episode of Tony T's Tune Talk, we're going to take a look at a few of them. Doug Feger was raised in Oak Park, a suburb outside Detroit, Michigan. And while he was growing up, the singer, songwriter, and guitarist played in an eclectic rock band called Sky, as well as in something called the Sunset Bombers. Now, Sky had received a modest amount of acclaim, including being produced by Rolling Stones producer Jimmy Miller. But the band broke up without having any real chart success. As a result, Doug Feger made the decision to move to Los Angeles and start another band. Shortly after he got to L.A., Feger met Burton Avare, talented lead guitarist and backing vocalist and keyboard player, and the two of them started a songwriting partnership. Feger had also known a brilliant drummer named Bruce Gary for a number of years before they all formed The Knack in 1978 with bassist Prescott Niles. Niles actually joined the fledgling band a week before their first show in June of 1978. Within months of making their live debut, the band gained a reputation for their tight sets and excellent original songs. They were also playing the most popular clubs on the Sunset Strip and jamming with such guest musicians as Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty, and Raymond Zarek of The Doors. This quickly led to the knack becoming the subject of a record label bidding war, a wonderful place for a young band to be. The band was pursued by 10 record labels, but they decided on Capitol Records who gave the knack what was, at the time, the largest signing sum in the label's history. The band's debut album for Capitol, Get the Knack, showed that the investment was going to pay off. It was one of the year's best-selling albums, held the number one spot on Billboard magazine's album chart for five consecutive weeks, and sold two million copies in the United States. The lead-off single, My Sharona, was a number one hit in the U.S., and it became the number one song of 1979. The follow-up single, Good Girls Don't, peaked at number 11 in the U.S. and went to number one in Canada. Great accomplishment, guys. But the band's quick rise to the top of the charts did cause a bit of a backlash. 
Capitol Records' packaging of Get the Knack included a perceived cover likeness to the album Meet the Beatles, with the record's center label also being the same design and style as the Beatles' early 1960s records. Couple that with the band's retro 1960s look and their pop rock sound, and you quickly have detractors accusing this very talented band of being nothing but Beatle ripoffs. The band and Capitol's record company denied these accusations, even though Doug Feger did acknowledge the band's likeness to the Beatles, claiming that it was their intention to present the Knack as a replica of the British invasion. He went on to mention how fans of the Knack had not been able to experience the times of the 1960s, and that it was wrong to deny them the privilege of experiencing something similar to it. But the critics fought back, claiming that the band was imposing artificial memories of the 1960s on those who didn't know better. In the end, while Get the Knack has come to be considered a classic power pop album of the late 70s, all of these attacks on the band may have affected the sales of the group's subsequent albums. But while the band's second album, But the Little Girls Understand, did suffer a little bit from a sophomore slump that would normally trouble any band who had colossal sales with their debut album, the rest of the band's catalog, including their 1991, 1998, and 2001 releases, are all terrific power pop records. Even Figure's 1999 solo album, First Things First, is absolutely worth pursuing for any fan of great pop rock. Out of the ashes of the tremendous pub rock band, the Kersal Flyers, pub rock being another genre that we might visit on Tony T's tune talk sometime down the road, came a group called The Records, featuring Kersal Flyers drummer Will Birch. John Wicks had joined the Flyers just as they were on the verge of splitting up, and right around the time that he and Birch had started writing songs together with Wicks as musical composer and Birch as lyricist. They decided to continue writing songs together with the hopes of starting a new four-piece group, one which Birch pre-christened The Records. The group's lineup initially included bassist Phil Brown and lead guitarist Brian Alterman, whose guitar riffs often have been compared to that of the Birds. Alterman was actually replaced by Hugh Gower in 1978. Like Birch and Wicks, Gower and Brown were both music veterans. The new group was heavily influenced by British invasion bands like the Beatles and the Kinks, and by earlier power pop groups such as Badfinger, Big Star, and the Raspberries. And with power pop experiencing a renaissance on both sides of the Atlantic, thanks in large part to the burgeoning punk and new wave movement, the records were ready for success. To help them along, the group was hired to back stiff record singer and power pop darling Rachel Sweet on the Be Stiff 78 tour. During those shows, the records would open with a set of their own original tasty songs. On the strength of these live shows and their demos, the band was signed to Virgin Records in 1978. Their debut single, Starry Eyes, was released in the UK that December, and it has since become their best-known song and an oft-covered power pop standard. Allmusic.com calls Starry Eyes a near-perfect song that defined British power pop in the 70s. Due in part to its very clear influence by American power pop, the song was an even bigger hit in the U.S. It peaked at number 56 on the Billboard Hot 100 in October of 1979. The band's debut album was called Shades in Bed. It was produced by Robert Mutt Lang, and it yielded another hit single, Tina Rama, the band's second best-known song. The album was released in the U.S. in July of 1979 under the highly original title, The Records, with a slightly different song sequencing and with the original single version of Starry Eyes replacing a re-recording that appeared on the UK edition. This album peaked at number 41 on the Billboard charts. And that was the pinnacle of the record's success. The band would record two more albums with varied lineups, but neither one would give the band any further hit singles. But you know, the record's first album, along with the excellent compilation album Smashes, Crashes, and Near Misses, are absolutely worth pursuing. And on a personal note, I am a huge fan of the band's take on Tim Moore's song Rock and Roll Love Letter, 
a tune that had been a big hit single for the Bay City Rollers in 1976. Now, I mentioned that the group The Raspberries had been a big influence on the records, so let's talk about that Cleveland-based band who had a run of highly successful hit singles in the early 1970s. AllMusic.com describes the music of The Raspberries as featuring exquisitely crafted melodies and achingly gorgeous harmonies. The members of the band were known for their clean-cut public image with their short hair and matching suits, which brought them teeny bopper attention, as well as scorn from the mainstream and rock music media outlets who labeled them as totally uncool. But the group drew their influences, as is often the case with power pop bands, from the British Invasion era, especially the Beatles, the Who, the Hollies, and the Small Faces, and they often kind of worked the mod sensibilities of those mid-60s bands into their image. In both the US and the UK, the Raspberries helped to pioneer the power pop music style that truly took off after the group disbanded. They also have a following among a group of musical legends that includes such diverse names as Jack Bruce, Ringo Starr, and Courtney Love. The Raspberries' classic lineup consisted of multi-instrumentalist and vocalist Eric Carmen, guitarist Wally Bryson, drummer Jim Bonfanti, and guitarist and bassist Dave Smalley. The group had its roots in two of Cleveland's most successful local bands of the late 1960s, The Choir and Cyrus Erie. The Choir scored a regional hit single and recorded a number of other excellent 45 releases, but it wasn't enough to keep the band together after the turn of the decade, and they disbanded in 1970. And though the choir had been the local group of the record deal, Cyrus Erie, founded by brothers Michael and Bob McBride, became the better drawing local act after a fellow named Eric Carmen joined them in 1967. Now at one point when the choir had split temporarily, Eric Carmen persuaded that band's guitarist, Wally Bryson, to join Cyrus Erie. After releasing one single on Epic Records, Bryson returned to the choir and Cyrus Erie disbanded. After discussions between Eric Carmen and Jim Bonfanti of Cyrus Erie about forming a new group, the first lineup of the Raspberries came together. In 1971, the final, most popular lineup with Dave Smalley on rhythm guitar fell into place. The Raspberries produced a demo tape that went to the desk of producer Jimmy Iyanar, who had an immediate feel for what the group wanted to do. After a major label bidding war, the band signed to Capitol Records the same label that won the knack a few years later. The group's musical style arose from a variety of rock and roll groups that the members loved, especially The Who. Eric Carmen said in the late 1980s, Pete Townsend coined the phrase power pop to define what The Who did. For some reason, it didn't stick to The Who, but it did stick to these groups that came out in the 70s that played kind of melodic songs with crunchy guitars and some wild drumming. It just kind of stuck to us like glue. And that was okay with us because The Who were among our highest role models. We absolutely loved The Who. Unlike The Who, the Raspberries wore matching ensembles on stage and they often made their stage entrance wearing tuxedos and large buffant hairdos, which according to Eric Carmen, complemented the style of our music. The band's single, Go All The Way, peaked at number five in the US in October 1972 sold over one million copies, and was awarded a gold disc. Afterwards, Carmen and Smiley switched instruments, with Carmen moving to rhythm guitar so that he could be up front on stage, while Smiley took over the bass. After the band released two excellent high-powered albums, Raspberries and Fresh, in 1972, creative tensions came to a head. Now, the problems arose largely because of Eric Carmen's alleged creative dominance which was notably backed by some serious commercial success, over the contributions of Wally Bryson and Dave Smalley. Accordingly, their album Side 3 turned out to be a more raw, aggressive effort than its predecessors, typified by the power pop classic, the album's opening track, Tonight. After that album's release, Smalley was ejected from the band and Bonfanti departed soon afterwards. The fourth and final Raspberries album, Starting Over, still highlighted the songs of Eric Carmen, but it featured a change in band personnel that would not survive beyond that single album. 
The Raspberries broke up in April 1975, but their style continued to influence other musicians. Bruce Springsteen has praised the Raspberries many times during his career, and Bruce's drummer, Mighty Max Weinberg, said that he based his drum style during that period off of Raspberry's drummer Michael McBride, particularly on the Springsteen album Darkness on the Edge of Town. Paul Stanley of Kiss, Tom Petty, and Axl Rose of Guns N' Roses have also cited the Raspberries as a major influence in their songwriting. Eric Carmen proceeded to a highly successful career as a solo artist. Wally Bryson and Dave Smalley resurrected the Raspberries name in 1999 for a fairly decent album, which included singer-songwriter Scott McCarl as vocalist. And in 2004, the original four-man lineup of the Raspberries reunited and undertook a well-received reunion tour that took most of 2005. That tour has been extremely well documented on the excellent live album, Raspberries Live on Sunset Strip. Now there are more older power pop bands to talk about on future episodes of Tony T's Tune Talk, but for now, let me just remind you that power pop is not dead. Great bands like the Weaklings, W-E-E-K-L-I-N-G-S, the On and Ons, and Weezer have continued to keep power pop alive and thriving. Also keep in mind that you can enjoy a lot of the great music that I've talked about here online through the streaming services available through your local public library. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Happy listening.